So the historical, historical account in Genesis can't possibly be correct. For this reason, uh, Creation Ministries International, for whom I'm a, a volunteer a speaker, a worker, um, this organization exists like, like Answers in Genesis and Institute of Creation Research. It's about equipping the church with the resources and materials, and that's why we bring on over here, we have these book tables with DVDs and resources, because we want to equip you so that you can answer the skeptic and the truth seeker in this so-called age of science. We're not about making money out of it. It's not about sales. It's about um, getting this information out as wide and, and, and as far as we can. But to both edify um, you as Christians, but also to use those resources as, as a witness in your, in your lives. We'd also like to um, offer you or let you know about this website. It uh, has over 6,000 fully searchable documents, all free. And um, there's a, like a, a feature article there every, every day of the week, six days. Six days of the week. <laughs> and of course, it's, it's just repeated through on Sunday, the, the Saturday article. So if you want to know where to find out about creation... Creation.com could be much simpler, could it? So you don't even have to write it down. It's very easy. Also, we'd like to offer you the opportunity to sign up for a like an email newsletter. It's free, totally free. All you need is a name and an uh, email address and, and a zip code. The idea here being is that um, if there's ministry in your area or there's some type of uh, um, you know, announcement in the news that requires a response from the organization and you'd be interested to hear this, then this info bytes, it's called, would get mailed out. And the reason we want a zip code is, is if there's area-specific type information or an event or something like that. This particular one, I'm sure you've heard of this guy, Steve Irwin, one of the craziest Australians that I, I know of. And uh, sadly, uh, uh, well, it was about two years ago now, wasn't it, that he got stabbed through the heart by that stingray's barb and, and died. Well, that kind of brought this sort of question. Really what I'm talking about today is why do um, bad things happen to good people? Why is there death and suffering in this world? Well, that article became the most hit article, and still is, on, on our website. So... That we informed people about that and kept them sort of in the loop as, as the news on that developed. So we have these uh, sign-up sheets that Scott has. He's going to pass them out now. If, if you would just like to sign up, totally free. If not, just pass it on. And um, we promise also we'll not spam you and you will not get... They're not regular. It's only when information is necessary to be sent would we even send it. But if we look at Scripture... We should understand that there is a God. Like if we look at, from Scripture, it tells us, you know, this, about this creation, that there is a God, a creator. But unless we believe in the Genesis creator, it would be very difficult for us to see a loving God. And this is what I mean. Sometimes we sing this song in church, all things bright and beautiful. And I have had occasion actually where I got up to say this right after they sang this song, which was rather nice, unengineered. But really the world isn't so bright and beautiful, is it? The trouble is, you see, it's not the same world that God originally created. It's a changed world. It's a different world. And we need to, look at, we need to learn to look at the world a different way. We need to see it in a different light. The evolutionists seem to understand something. They accuse us as creationists, and this is very typical here from David Attenborough, an atheist, anti-creationist. He said, when creationists talk about God creating, they always instance hummingbirds or orchids, sunflowers and beautiful things. But I tend to think instead of a parasitic worm that is boring through the eye of a boy sitting on a bank on a river in West Africa, a worm that, that's going to make him blind, and I asked them, are you telling me that the God you believe in, who you also say is all merciful God, who cares for each one of us individually, are you saying that God created this worm that can live in no other way than in an innocent child's eyeball? 
because that doesn't seem to me to coincide with a God who's full of mercy. So you see, he's accusing creationist Christians of believing in a God who's, who's not loving, all loving and all merciful. By the way, it's a, it's a lie about that worm only being able to live in, the, in, the, in a human eyeball. That's also another lie. This is often what's being said, so that's not even true at all. But it's certainly true that the world is a changed world. And we see reports like this while well, we had the Virginia Tech massacre not so long ago. And there was this massacre at the Jakala High School in Finland where this boy uh, shot, um, um, he killed eight people, including himself. And um, he went on some type of rampage. Well, he recorded on YouTube. Um, some information before he did this. He said, I as a natural selector will eliminate all who I see unfit, disgraces of human race and failures of natural selection. Note what's written on his t-shirt. Humanity is overrated. Human life is not sacred, he said. Humans are just a species among other animals and world does not exist only for humans. The faster human race is wiped out from this planet, the better. No one should be left alive pretty shocking, isn't it? I mean, clearly this boy was very disturbed. There's no doubt about it. But this type of teaching, this type of teaching is pervading our culture, has been around for at least the last 150 years. This is the non-Christian worldview. It's believed to be the natural order of things that over billions of years of earth history, we've had famines and diseases, we've had a process of uh, culling out of the weak through these so-called natural processes. Hitler applied it directly to his own people when he tried to move the handicap from his society in Nazi Germany. This is a, a, uh, an advertisement. 60,000 Reichsmarks you get... Uh, uh, sorry, 60,000 marks is what this handicapped person cost the community because of the, you know, the, the cost to keep them and so on. And Hitler uh, purged out over 250,000 white Aryan Germans because they had some kind of mental or physical handicap. I'm not talking about gypsies, Jews and all the rest of them. This is where this type of thinking led because Hitler um, took his lead from Darwin and Darwinian type thinking. Well, that's where it's, the thinking is based, isn't it, in this Darwinian theory of, of evolution. That has been the, the, the true history of our planet. And it says essentially that you and I are, are not much more than highly evolved pond scum, pond scum down the bottom there. And they put man up the top of that evolutionary tree. That's, uh, that's worth noting because they say really we all evolved through this sort of survival of the fittest and random processes over time. And they don't perceive man to be really any different from any other in the species. That's probably just a convenience the, to sell the message that they place him at the top there. Because look at these, what these Oxford professors say. This one is uh, Peter Atkins. When he's talking about man, he says, just a bit of slime on the planet. And Professor Richard Dawkins, now retired former zoology professor, he said, we live in a universe which has no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. My goodness, if I was one of those professors, I wouldn't even bother getting up in the morning. And Richard Dawkins has become somewhat of a, um, the high priest of the atheists. He's become what Jonathan Safady from Creation Ministry said is not Darwin's bulldog, but Darwin's Rottweiler. He's avidly promoting this against, very strongly against the Christian faith and, and creationists. So you can see this type of thinking and its basis is really a record of death and bloodshed. Survival of the weak, this process having continued for millions of years. And, but because of these evolutionary ideas, now often I'm not saying that, I'm not, I'm not saying that because of evolution... Um, it's nat this is a natural consequence, but often it's because of these evolutionary ideas people justify their um, immoral ways because there's no basis of morality in this type of thinking. You see, Jeffrey Dahmer, who was one of the worst serial killers in the US, um, he killed 17 people, I think it was, and even ate them. 
He said, if a, this is before he was executed, he said, if a person doesn't think there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behaviour to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we died, you know, that was it, there was nothing. This is sort of a relative morality. You can decide what truth is for yourself. And this is where this has all been leading because it really depends on who sets the rules. If you believe in a creator God, the God of the Bible, well, he set absolute standards and absolute rules that we need to live by. But if it's man who sets the rules or man decides truth, like in secular humanism, which is really a religion that says man can decide truth for himself, then there is really no absolutes. We see debates about abortion and euthanasia and these sort of things. Well, it's constantly changing because when man sets the rules, there are no absolute standards. However, if we look in, uh, in the Bible for where, where do Christian doctrines originate, we'll find that pretty well all originate in those first 11 chapters of Genesis. This is just a very brief list here of marriage, sin, death, the seven-day week, clothing, the curse or the fall, why Jesus is called the last Adam and even the gospel message can be found in, in the early chapters of Genesis. I'm not going to go into these in any detail, but um, I, I'm, I have a, a fairly strong interest in astronomy and cosmology and so I'm quite interested in the seven-day week. Because, you know, the earth rotates on its axis and we get a a 24-hour day. The moon goes around our planet 30 days a month approximately. Um, And the earth goes around the sun. We have one year, 365 days. But where do we get a seven-day week from? It's interesting that cultures through millennia, non-Judaic Christian cultures have used a seven-day week. The only place you can find it is in Genesis. God created in six days and rested on the seventh day. And if you go right back through history, you'll find that most cultures have used a seven-day week. And then there's clothing. That's an interesting one. I like to talk about this in Singapore, where it's like 26 to 30 degrees and never varies out of that. There's really no reason to wear clothes in Singapore. But you have to look into Genesis and you'll see God made them the first clothing. It was a covering for their shame. It was a typology, actually, of Christ covering for our sin. Of course, it's convenient in uh, colder weather too, right? And the curse. And, And the whole point of this talk is that the world is a changed world. That we now live in a sin cursed world. It's not the original world that God God created and so on. But what's been happening is that this this wedge here, evolutionary theory and millions of years of earth history illustrated by this wedge, has been come in, um, has separated the the Christian worldview from the foundation of the church, you know, the foundational doctrines of the church, which is this creation account that we find in the early chapters of Genesis. And this has largely come about in modern times, um, the last, say, 200 years, from A, the teachings or the the work of James Hutton, who who began this idea that we could look out in the, uh, the, uh, the geology of our planet and see slow and gradual changes in the present, and we could extrapolate that to long periods of time. And this was popularized by Charles Lyell, who took... Um, who was given as a gift actually by the captain of the, uh, the Beagle, the ship Beagle, when, when um, sorry, Charles Lyell wrote these um, books, The Principles of Geology, and when Charles Darwin went on the Beagle, he was given the first volume by the captain of the Beagle. So that book by Lyell on, on the slow and gradual changes in geology influenced the thinking of Charles Darwin when he went for his nice summer cruise down into South America. Darwin was largely a geologist at that point, but that gave him the setting to influence him in in terms of these ideas of biological evolution. And then 1859, he published his book on the origin of species with the 
you know, the evolution of all living, um, living um, creatures on, and plants and animals on this planet. So what has happened since then, so that's, that's about 150 years ago, right? In fact, last year was the 150-year anniversary. People have been accepting science. They've been reinterpreting the Bible, taking in the science. But instead of just accepting that science, I, I say we, I believe, we must ab- apply the Bible, what the Bible tells us to the question. The Bible, I believe, is God's perfect an unchanging word. Instead, as we often do, we reinterpret the Bible with our fallen minds because we're all subject to this curse. There's no long, we have no longer perfect creatures like Adam and Eve originally were. And we reinterpret the Bible. Sadly, though, those first 11 chapters in particular are the ones that fall victim to reinterpretation. And nowadays, you go to almost any Bible seminary, you will be hard-pressed to find a straightforward interpretation of, of the early chapters of Genesis. Instead, it makes much more sense to take the creation account as real history rather than this evolutionary theory. And I'm talking about the whole story from the Big Bang, cosmic evolution, everything, 13 billion years ago, you know, the whole big picture story right through to the formation of our solar system and the earth and the evolution of all creatures on this planet. We need to see the Bible as a real history book, the true history book of of the universe. You know, history is his story, God's story. And really, it's not about science anyway. It's about history and you need a history book to answer real history. Too many of us bring our own ideas, man's ideas, with our fallen brains, and we reinterpret the Bible with those ideas. And I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, when I was young, I do recall going to church. My grandmother was a big influence in my life and, and made sure that I went to Sunday school. So I do have some recollection of belief in the Lord as a, a young child. But during my teen years in high school, um, and modern science teachings and things like that, I became an atheist. In fact, when I was in my second last year of high school, I wrote a book with a co-author on cosmology, comparing Big Bang theories and steady state theories, which was fairly popular at that time. Just shows you how old I am. And I did become a very firm atheist, but I think back now, and I think really I was running away from God. I was using those beliefs in the so-called science to, to reject a creator because I knew ultimately I would have to obey him. In fact, I was a believer in the steady state theory that says essentially there was no beginning, there was no creation of the universe and there was no end. It was like eternal, it always been. And therefore, there was no need for any God. Thankfully, in my university years, I came to know the Lord and for two years I believed in Christ, I believed in the Bible, but I still believed in this evolutionary history of our planet until a more mature Christian, a conservative Christian came to me and said, have you ever read Genesis, just reading Genesis as as if it's real history? And I said, no, I haven't. So he said, do it and I'll talk to you next week. And I did. I read it and I asked the Lord to show me, could this be real history? And within a few hours, I was a creationist. Because it made much more sense than any evolutionary theory. God really spoke to me. I'm sure the Holy Spirit had a great influence on on me in reading that. But nowadays we see people who are reinterpreted the Bible and there are many different reinterpretations. I don't want to go into in in any detail but this is just a a short um, cartoon of a number of these different interpretations. Obviously theistic evolution is as it sort of implies is that God used evolution. That the Big Bang history of our universe is true. We have billions of years of of, um, cosmic 
evolution, if you like, expansion of the universe, stars explode, dust forming, our solar nebula condenses and the earth eventually condenses, oceans form 3.8 billion years ago and at some point after that you have some non-life to life episode on the side of a volcano or something and then over billions of years of history the evolution of plants and animals on this planet God just started it off at that Big Bang moment 13.7 billion years ago. That doesn't sound like the God of the Bible to me. That sounds like deism or something. Certainly a pretty impotent God that he did nothing else. And then the day-age theory, that's simply saying those days of Genesis, those six 24-hour days that, that the Hebrew so clearly describes with evening and a morning, that those days are long periods of time, like a thousand years each or a million years each. But that's inconsistent, isn't it? Because you have to interpret the Bible consistently. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. The framework hypothesis, well, there's no intention there that the, to, to imply that Genesis has any real history in it. Genesis 1, anyway, the early chapters that it's just all um, allegory to teach us good moral stories, that the lessons are correct, but that there's no history in it. The gap theory places billions of years between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. Billions of years, in fact, they say, within there somewhere, all the fossil record was laid down. All those fossil-bearing sediments were laid down by some flood called Lucifer's flood. A flood that the Bible makes no reference to but spends chapter after chapter speaking about Noah's flood. And there's a problem there too. They have to say then that Noah's flood was a local flood because if you had Lucifer's flood that laid down all those sediments, you can't come and have another global flood that wiped it out and laid down more. You see? So that Noah's flood has, has to be a local flood. So it just leads to one reinterpretation or compromise after another. And then the progressive creationists have come in and they've become very strong through this ministry of Dr. Hugh Ross, the Reason to Believe ministry, become very popular in the Pentecostal type charismatic churches. Very large churches are taking this on. They say the Big Bang history is all true. The geology of our solar system and our planet, the billions of years of the past history of this planet, that's all true. It's just that over the last few billion years, God created a progressively... Evolution didn't happen, biological evolution didn't happen, but as one species went extinct, God created another species so that in the fossil record, which they say was laid down over millions of years, it looks like one evolved into another, one species evolved into another. So these are a sort of a bit of a summary and um, all of these views, and there is more that I haven't covered, but all of them really fail in the light of this scripture, Exodus 20.11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth and the sea and all is in them and he rested on the seventh day. You see, you can't put in a gap there. You can't put in a gap of billions of years between creating the heavens and the earth. He says he worked, he, he worked for six days and rested on the seventh day. Verse 9 talks about um, the Hebrew people. He's saying you should work for six days and rest on the seventh day because that's what I did. You should order your work week accordingly. This is really all about the, the Sabbath, to keep the Sabbath holy. One of the commandments, right? So you can't have this inconsistency because we're not going to work for six million years and rest for a million years, you know? We're not, are we? Now, I know there are some children that wouldn't mind that as long as it was on Sunday, the million years, I mean. But it doesn't, it's inconsistent, isn't it? You have to interpret the Bible consistently. And also we should note that this is part of the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his own finger in stone. So I'm inclined to believe that God knew what he was talking about when he said this. Very dangerous for us as created beings with fallen, sin-cursed minds to reinterpret what God intended to say. And you can ask any, any he Hebrew um, professor in world-leading universities who are pretty well all atheists, and they will say those early chapters of Genesis are intended as real history. What the straightforward meaning you would get when you read it, that's what the author intended it you to understand six ordinary 
days of creation, around six or 7,000 years ago, which you get from the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11. Just add them up. You always wondered why would God bother putting all this begats, 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 begats in there, right? And it's not just to send you to sleep at night when you're trying to get to sleep. It's because he wants you to count up the years and then you can connect it to building of Solomon's temple or some historical event and you can work it out. And I'm not too worried whether it's six or it's seven. It doesn't matter. It's not millions and billions of years. It's a recent creation. And this is a very good book, which we have out here on these book tables, written by Dr. Jonathan Safady, that refutes all of those compromised positions. And I would just recommend that you have a look at that resource later on. So we're talking here today about two worldviews. And no matter how you break it down, they essentially break down into two worldviews. The ruling worldview of this planet, not, not just amongst the evolutionists, the atheists, is also, it's also most common amongst the Christians. And it's really a worldview where man decides truth for himself, that evolution, these billions, and years, billions of years of history of our planet is all true and death and suffering are just a natural part of life. As I mentioned, that would have been my worldview before I became a Christian. However, I suggest, and this is what I'm saying to you, we need to put on the evolutionary... or ev- ev- Sorry, not evolutionary. You better erase that from the tape. We need to... <laughs> I'll never live that one down otherwise. <laughs> we need to put on the creation glasses or the, the biblical glasses to see the world through God's word and then it, it makes so much more sense and really that's saying we need to take God's word as authority from the very first verse I believe it for many years I've been working in a tertiary institution a university a lot of them there think I'm crazy but I see no problem with taking God's word as real history, taking the the Bible as intended. I see no conflict with any science, any work I do, even with my studies and research in cosmology and the structure of the universe. God's word makes so much more sense. And that worldview then says that the creation was only six or so thousand years ago. There was no death before the fall, before the curse. And God created all the animal species, animal kinds. We don't say species because species could come from kinds. The dinosaurs lived with man in the original creation. Noah's flood occurred and so on and so forth. So this is a different worldview. We then need to see the world through our worldview. That's how we interpret all information with whatever glasses we happen to have on. And... We're talking about science, and we're going to talk about science here, and I'm, there are two types. The type I do in the lab, I'm largely an experimental physicist. I'm essentially a clockmaker. Time metrologist, not metro- meteorology. I don't know anything about weather. <laughs> but measurement of time. I build very ultra-precise cryogenic um, sapphire oscillators, clocks, the most stable in the universe. When I go to the lab each day, I expect if I do the same thing, it's a repeatable science. It's the type of science that builds jumbo jets, cell phones, this computer, modern medicines, whatever. We rely on this, this knowledge. That's experimental or operational science. There's another type of science we would call historical science. It's much weaker Because it's really about constructing stories about the past. Like this guy's looking at this fossil of this fish and he's trying to imagine what happened in the past. The fossil he has is in the present. So to construct this story of the past is really a lot of guesswork. A very good illustration of this is this television series. I'm sure everyone's seen it, even though it's often steeped in some evolutionary thinking. It's called CSI. Right? There are many, many variants of it now. CSI Miami is my favourite. You know the guy with the glasses? <laughs> but they go onto a crime scene, they take their box, they gather their paint scrapings and DNA and fingerprints and all this sort of stuff. They go back to the lab 
And they run it through some very expensive machinery. They do experimental science. It's repeatable, right? DNA analysis and so on. And then they come to the point where it's historical science. They collect the ideas together and they formulate an idea of what happened in the crime, how it went down. They have no access to the past. They can't, can't see the past. And to, by the way, as an aside, time machines have not been invented and will not be invented. We can do an experimental science experiment right now in a few seconds that proves the impossibility of time travel. All right, you ready? Tell me, does anyone know of any time tourists coming back from the future? <laughs> so if someone in the future could think of how to build a time machine, doesn't have to build it yet, as soon as that possibility arises, we'll see time tourists coming back from the future. You see? So it's impossible. Time travel can't happen. <laughs> but it's important to understand this, that in the CSI shows, all in one hour, they get the culprit in a room and they get an eyewitness confession who saw how it all happened, right? But where is the eyewitness account for the last four and a half billion years of Earth history or, or many more, tens of billions of years of the history of this, this uh, universe, the cosmos? There isn't one, right? And really we're talking about history anyway. We're not talking about science. But God has written us a faithful testament in, in the book, God's book, the Holy Bible, where he has given us the true history of this universe. And as I told you, it's really not a science question. It's a history question. Many people associate, however, these type of fossils. This is a fish fossil, obviously. They associate this with millions, even billions of years of Earth history. And you can see, obviously, this one, this fossil formed very quickly, didn't it? Right? Because this guy's been caught while he was eating his lunch. Okay? Proves that fossils form quickly. Now, a fossil is obviously the impression of the animal or plant left in a stone or rock. It doesn't necessarily describe how it died, but certainly the way it was buried. This one, in this case, I think, um, this guy must have been buried very rapidly because I've seen in those nature documentaries where one fish eats another fish and it, pff, they have to replay that in slow motion for you because it can happen so fast. So it's really about burial and how it was buried. Well, um, this is what some biology textbooks tell us. This one is taken from the Australian Academy of Science and it was used in a text in, uh, in um, a state of Australia. Uh, I showed this at a, a church not so long ago and a biologist told me no longer they would say this. But this wasn't so old actually. And basically moving from left to right, you see that fish swimming and the mountains in the background, the rivers are eroding away, the fish dies as you're moving over this way and falls to the bottom of the ocean or the, the sea, the mountains are eroding more, the sediments cover that fish and then moving further to the right, the sediments pack down as the mountains erode more through that river and you get the, set, the, the packing down, the, the fossilization of the fish on the bottom of that ocean. But that's a total myth. You know that's a myth. You've never seen a documentary where there's fish in the ocean lying on the bottom waiting to be covered up with sediments. Little sign stuck next to it saying, hold on, don't eat me, I'm being fossilized over the next 100,000 million years. Have you ever seen that? No, it's a myth. It doesn't happen. It's impossible, I'm telling you. Because anything that dies in the ocean is rapidly ripped apart and eaten up and then the crustaceans come in and, and it's bones in, in no time at all. Now, I told you earlier I was an experimental scientist. I am largely an experimental physicist and my daughter Catherine has goldfish tanks at home. And so one time I walked over to the chemistry uh, store and got some cyanide and took it home and put it in one of her tanks. And, you know, I discovered they don't even sink to the bottom, they float. <laughs> now you're thinking, what kind of a guy have we got in our church now? Yeah, I know. You know, she just couldn't keep her fish alive. Eventually she abandoned it because they kept dying of natural causes all the time. <laughs> This is how you get a fish fossil. This is Freddie Fish swimming along minding his own business. Underwater we can get these rapid um, turbidity currents like underwater mudslides 
And they can happen very fast, travel at like 60, 70 kilometres an hour, I believe. It's, it's amazing stuff. Okay, Freddie gets rapidly buried. The sediment's packed down under high temperature and pressure. Uh, oxygen is excluded. Bacterial breakdown is retarded. And you get the calcium and carbon in the body of the fish exchanging with the silicates in the, in the sediments. And quite rapidly, you get a Freddie fish fossil. Right? Now, you can do this at home if you like. What you can do is order a cement truck, back it up to your driveway, and dump it on your dog. <laughs> And in no time, not very long, you'll get a dog fossil. <laughs> but if your dog just dies in the backyard, I guarantee if you leave it there, you are not going to get a fossilised dog. However, having said that, fossilisation doesn't, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't always tell us about how something lived. Because in, South, in, in Tasmania, the small island off the bottom of Australia, there's this fossil bluff cliff, and it's loaded with fossils, both of Possums and whales, all jumbled up together. Now, I'm not sure at what level of education you get here in the United States, but do you know where possums live? <laughs> in trees, right? Now, this is a tough one. Where do whales normally live? <laughs> yeah, in the ocean. So, you see, they weren't living together, were they? But how would such, an, a, a, how would such a formation come about? On slow and gradual changes? I don't think so. But if you imagine the earth was inundated with a global flood, 10,000 miles long mid-Atlantic ridge breaking up volcanic activity, hundreds of feet tsunamis sweeping around the world, a total catastrophe, you would expect that billions of things would be buried under sedimentary layers, laid down by water. And that's what we see all over the earth. I was at Grand Canyon a few years ago and took photos of the uh, Coconino sandstones and you see what's called cross-bedding. It's like sandstones that have been laid down sand, laid down underwater, and they're like waves in it. And then you have the layers cut off at the top, like catastrophic events, not slow and gradual changes. And that's exactly what we find. We find Billions of dead things, fossils all over this planet, even to the highest mountains, laid down by water under thousands and thousands of feet of sedimentary layers. It's totally consistent with Noah's flood. In Australia, someone found this ring, metal, this uh, fossilised ring, and uh, this was some years ago, and they sent it down to the, uh, to the creation ministry office and if you held that up and hit it with a hammer, it would ring like a bell. They cracked it open and they found inside very small crustaceans, um, marine fossils, and they also found number eight fencing wire. Now, you're not going to tell me, are you, that 65 million years ago someone was herding dinosaurs up in the northwest of Western Australia and we have now fossilised number eight fencing wire? No. You see, fossilisation can occur rapidly. This was in 1920s through the 1950s. The large, um, we call them stations. They're not, they're, they're not farms, they're massive, like ranches, right? And in Australia, these, some of these are bigger than European countries. So they're massive things. And they were putting the fencing along the ocean and some of the contractors threw the extra wire into the ocean. Rapid fossilisation. There are many examples of this and we uh, have a, a magazine, a quarterly magazine called Creation Magazine and um, there are many illustrations and examples that come out in this and I would like to give you the opportunity uh, later in the message to, um, to sign up for that. Here's another illustration from Creation Magazine. Red blood cells, this is in the late 90, 1990s, were found in dinosaur bones, in fossilised T-Rex bone that was supposed to be 65 million years old. In fact, these bones were not even fully permineralised. In other words, they were a little bit fresh, if you like. <laughs> but red blood cells should not survive 65 million years. The scientists were absolutely gobsmacked over this and wrote in an article, it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone, but of course I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? You see, she was shocked because she had her evolutionary glasses on. She had this worldview that said that 
evolution is true. So how is this possibly consistent with it? And that is why she was so shocked. Well, she continued this research, and I would add, actually, that she got a lot of um, uh, criticism from her peers. They thought she was a bit loopy for even discovering this. I mean, she discovers a fact and they think she's mad. Well, she went on and she got more. She got T-Rex bones from three other different sources, um, even as old as, they said, 68 million years old. And she took these, some of these bones, and these are expensive, so she had to buy them, slices of it, and dissolved it in some sort of a solution and found behind that what was left was resilient, flexible, connective tissue. And this is the same sort of thing that you can do with a chicken bone. I don't know if you've ever done this. You put it in vinegar for a few days and you pull it out. The calcium is dissolved away and in the bone is all this connective tissue that makes a sort of a rubbery chicken bone. Well, they found not only that, they found blood vessels and red blood cells. Well, Mary Schweitzer did. And she reported in Science magazine, as the fossil dissolved transparent vessels were left behind, it was totally shocking, Schweitzer says. I didn't believe it until we'd done it 17 times. See the repeatable science there, the 17 times? But what was the shocking bit was the historical science, wasn't it? That that could possibly be true within that framework of her belief system, which was that atheistic worldview. And that's why it shocked her. But for a paleontologist, when he digs up a fossil, he doesn't find the thing with some sort of label on it. He finds this evidence, the bone, or really it's the fossilised bone, it's often just rock, um, he doesn't get that label 65 million years. Now, I don't know if you didn't realise that. And this is quite interesting, really. The paleontologist... This happens, of course, in many fields, but the paleontologist is a very instructive example because, you see, he's got layers of fossils in rock layers, and he digs up this fossil... And say he doesn't know how old the fossil is. He calls his geologist friend and he says, you know, how old are the rock layers I found my fossil in? Well, then the geologist says to him, what fossils did you find in the layers? Because they date the, the rocks. The fossils date the rocks, but the rocks date the fossils. It's totally circular in reasoning. This is quite correct and quite true. For, for us as Christians, though, this is an important issue. And the reason it's an important issue because when God said after that creation, after he had finished the creation, the Garden of Eden, you can imagine, was this perfect paradise, right? Nothing would hurt or destroy. There was no death, no suffering there. And God said it was very good. How could it be very good if the Garden of Eden was built after millions of years of death and sub struggle, su survival of the fittest. And the fossil record is, is a record of death. It's of suffering. There are diseases. There are modern-day bone diseases that are identified in the fossil record. And there are some that teach, for example, the, the progressive creationists teach that God created the Garden of Eden 40,000 years ago after billions of years of evolution. Well, they don't say evolution. They say progressive creation, but death a record of death of billions of years. Theistic evolutionists would say evolution occurred. So how could it have been very good? It makes no sense. You can't have death before Adam's sin. The Bible tells us only through Adam's sin did death enter the world. But let's turn this around and realize that God created the Garden of Eden, a perfect paradise six or so thousand years ago, after Adam's sin, death and suffering entered the world, the whole creation, and then the fossil-bearing sediments were laid down since that time. So they, they can't be any older than the uh, age of the creation itself. Romans 5 tells us that literal sin means literal death, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and this way death came upon all men because all sinned. And some tell us say, that this verse is only applying to mankind, not to the entire creation, the whole universe. Romans 8 tells us the contrary, though. It says the whole universe is waiting to be delivered. It's groaning, in fact. It's in bondage to sin. And thankfully, though, that... In Romans 8, we read that Jesus Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death, right? 
That's why we're here, because of Jesus' redemptive power. And it makes much more sense, doesn't it, that, that the whole creation is subject to sin. Christ comes in with this hope, this promise of our redemption. We now look forward to in, in the uh, new, new heaven and new earth. But evolution says millions of years of suffering before even man arrived on the scene. Because they say man didn't start to evolve until like a million years ago when we evolved from some past ape-like ancestor or something. And that through a process of death and suffering. The Bible tells us the opposite. Through Adam's decision, death came. These two worldviews are incompatible. We can't mesh them together in any way. And this is the biggest problem if you try to reinterpret Genesis this way. This is then the Christian worldview, the way we see it, called the seven seas here. The creation account described in Genesis 1 and 2, the corruption that came in through Adam's sin and the change, the whole uh, creation changed because of that. The catastrophe, Noah's flood, the remaking of the surface of the earth, the uh, total catastrophe and the, the new earth afterwards, which was repopulated by the... Um, people and the uh, animals that went on the ark, the confusion at Babel, the separation of language groups and therefore the separation of ethnic groups today that spread around the earth. And there's a lot of very interesting stuff on that, that the Chinese history, for example, be, can, can be traced back, right back through to, to, to the, um, well, at least to the uh, rituals of Noah after he came off the ark. Do we have this book, Scott, um, The Faith of Our Fathers? Where's Scott? Can't see him. There he is. We don't have it. It's a very good book, Faith of Our Fathers, and it traces the Chinese history back through their classics, the ancient classics uh, that Confucius wrote on. And they believed in the one true God. They called um, Shandi, which translates as the God above all gods. And I've been to China, to the Temple of Heaven, where it's very clear that they worship the original creator God. Pretty amazing stuff. Anyway, so before the fall, it was life of ease. Just pick that fruit off the tree and, um, and eat it, you know. No hard work after the fall, toil in the ground and hard work. It's, in, it's a different world. It's a, it's a change world. It's not the world that God originally created. And somewhere in there, in this sin-cursed world, Animals, some animals became meat eaters. Carnivory entered the world. Sometimes we see or hear these documentaries, David Attenborough type ones where he's whispering, you're out there on the plains of Africa and the gazelles are bouncing around having fun and then the lion jumps out and grabs one and brings it down for its lunch and he says, isn't it wonderful? Isn't this wonderful? But it's not. It's an intruder. It's not part of God's original creation. As Tennyson said, nature is red in tooth and claw. There's no doubt about it. But this is not the world God originally created. So that sort of is really why is there death and suffering in this world? This is one of the most asked questions in this ministry. And if we look at it from that big picture of the Bible, the whole message of the Bible, it makes much more sense. It's really our fault. It's our ancestors' decision because we are all kinsmen of Adam, right? And Jesus Christ can only save the sons and daughters of Adam. He's the kinsman redeemer. Who was Cain's wife is also a very commonly asked question. And it's a very important question because I think it's been a stumbling block to many. And personally, I remember this when my father had said, said, asked my mother this question when I was a young boy. And maybe I was only eight or nine years old. I don't know why I remember this, but he said to her, was talking to my mother that he had been asking the church who was Cain's wife. Because, you know, Cain was um, son of Adam and Eve, right? There were Cain killed Abel. Later it says Cain took a wife and went off and had kids or something, right? That's a paraphrase. <laughs> to my father, that meant, though, the Bible was wrong because the Bible didn't specifically say who she was or where she came from. Of course, the implication is that, that people evolved and there were different tribes and evolution's true, the Bible's not true. But the Bible, uh, the, the church of the time did not answer him. And so he rejected Christ, he rejected the church and he's never received God, never received him. He's still alive, 
There's still hope, but because of that, that was a pivotal thing in his life. It's really important that we can answer the truth seekers when they are seeking the truth. And that's why uh, this book here, the Answers book, answers many of these questions, 64 of them in fact, uh, which are the most commonly asked questions. You could have a look at that also on the book table. So just in summary, it was originally this perfect creation, the perfect paradise, marred by sin through Adam's decision, death and disease and pain and suffering, all these things entered the world. So it's a broken world. But through Jesus Christ, we have now this promise that God will restore things back to that original creation, that perfect paradise, that Eden, with a new heaven and a new earth that he promised is coming. And it says here in Revelations, there'll be no more death, there'll be no sorrow, no crying. So you see, it was a real thing, this entry of this death into the creation, because God's going to remove it in part of that restoration process. And in, it says in the heavenly city, in the New Jerusalem, there was the tree of life. The tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. But Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve had to be cast out of the garden after their sin because they, would, they could not partake of that tree and live forever in their sin-cursed state. So it was a real tree then because it's a real tree coming in the future. It wasn't a metaphor. And it says there's no more curse. The curse is being removed. We often see these sort of things where people are um, campaigning against issues like abortion and euthanasia and pornography and all these things, right? Christian organisations are doing it. There's, There's one in Australia I know and I'm sure they're here too. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not really the problem in the society. There's a far deeper underlying problem. And the underlying problem is illustrated by these castles here. This humanist religion is attacking the church at the creation foundation, the very basis upon which the gospel, which the Christian message is based. And they're destroying it. They know if they can destroy that creation message, the entire edifice of the Christian church will collapse. So that's really the problem. And that's why we bring these resources because... Um, I know from this Nobel laureate, he tells me that you can only, a guy who studies how people learn, you can only remember seven new things in your frontal cortex. Apparently after that, everything falls out, you know. Carl Wyman, I don't know if you know him, he's, he's been studying this. We don't remember much from a talk, that's certainly true. And so we need to get these resources so that we can understand these issues and we can use them in our walk with the Lord and, and our witness. The solution is that, that we arm ourselves with this material so that we can fight back against the humanists, the evolutionists, spiritually I mean fight back, and we can then shore up the creation, creation foundation of our churches and we can become strong, we can edify the church and then we can have an effective ministry against this type of onslaught that is happening. I'm running out of time here, but I'd like to then give you the opportunity to sign up for this creation magazine because it's about the best resource that you could possibly get. It has no advertising, it's 56 pages, it's full colour, glossy magazine. If the devil has glossy magazines, why can't? Jesus have glossy magazines, you know. And we would like to give you this opportunity. Today, we're going to pass out these clipboards that look something like this. You only have to check a box to sign up for one year or three years, $25 for one year, 68 for three years. If you sign up today, you can get a free back issue and take it home with you, and you can fill out some forms, and you will get invoiced for this on your first subscription. By the way, at the book tables today, we're not taking cash. We have an invoice arrangement. That's right, Scott. We have an invoice arrangement so you can take books and resources and then you will get invoiced from the ministry office. So something like this, it works. You just fill out this form. Scott's going to pass out these clipboards. Check one year or three years. Write your name. Don't write Ben Chong if it's not your name. And uh, take off that little coupon and then take it up to Scott afterwards and... uh, and we'll take care of the rest. You might want, might want to peruse those book tables when you take your coupon up and you'll get a free back issue with the coupon. 
And while he's handing those out, there's a range of DVDs up there that you might want to look at when you go to the book tables. Um, This one on Darwin, his life. This is the voyage that shook the world. This is probably the best uh, Christian documentary ever produced, in my opinion. I think about one million US dollars was spent on its production that gives a, a... I think, a balanced view of the life of Darwin and really what the man was about. You can use this in, uh, to get into um, non-Christian type media and environments because it is a very soft sell, but the point is clearly made. You can use this type of message in evangelism. The creation message is a powerful tool in Christian evangelism. Instead of starting with Jesus, start with where the, we come from. The, I'm talking about the universe, the planet, the species, everything. Where does the human race come from? People want to know the answers to these questions. Those are the same sort of questions that held me up from believing in God when I was in my high school years. There's another one here, Hubble Bubble, Big Bang and Trouble. It really is. This is myself, a doc, a doc, um, a um, presentation I presented some years ago at a creation camp. This is really about saying we can look out in the cosmos, we can look at God's creation, and we are seeing it as God created it on day four of creation week. We're looking back in time and we can see the creation (coughs) kind of as it happens. This sort of adds a a little bit of a different perspective to Psalm 19.1 where it says the expanse shows the work of his hands. This one on aliens, UFOs and the Bible by Gary Bates. You know that 3% of US Americans surveyed in Gallup polls said they've been abducted by aliens? Do the calculation. That's 9 million Americans. You guys have a serious problem in this country. (laughs) Very interesting and worth a look at. Biblical geology, how does that fit in? Six days, creation 6,000 years ago, but don't they tell us the planet's 4.6 billion years old? This, this really helps you understand the rocks and dispels some of the myths and helps you see where things fit together. This is a new resource that's just come out by J- Jonathan Safady, the greatest hoax on earth, question mark. It's a a refuting of Richard Dawkins' latest book, The Greatest Show on Earth, where he claims strong evidence for evolutionary theory. And Jonathan refutes all of his evidence, resoundedly just refutes it. Very powerful book that has just come out. Have a look at that one as well. Where are we here? Yeah. So if you're an evolutionist, you would be quite surprised to see something like this, wouldn't you? Because man and dinosaurs should not be living together. In fact, dinosaurs are supposed to have died out 65 million years ago and man didn't start to evolve until about a, a million years ago, according to their alleged theory. So we do see, and it's hard to see it here, so below it's been outlined, but we see rock art. These are, this one is in the US and the next one is as well which could be nothing other than something like a sauropod dinosaur. And this is recent times, as Indians have drawn these. There's another one. There's lots of examples of this, of uh, records through history of man living with dinosaurs. Even the famous stories like George and the dragon, you know, the guy that slew the dragon and so on. This one here is from Cambodia. This is thousands of years old, certainly at least hundreds of years old. And this, the reason we know this is because there's a, um, a sort of a bacterial um, growth that builds up on these uh, rock surfaces. It's called patina. And it's the same way that archaeologists are able to date uh, archaeological finds in Israel and so on. This patina is impossible to forge. And it's certainly hundreds of years old that predates any fossil discoveries of uh, stegosaurs, but that looks certainly, the best description is something like a stegosaur, right? This is also um, reported in a, in a, uh, by an Irish writer in 900 AD where he talked about an encounter with a large beast like this with iron, tails, iron nails on its tail pointing backwards uh, with a head shaped like a horse's and thick legs and strong claws, written by an Irish 
an Irishman only 900 years ago. Sorry, not a Welshman, but I'm sure there was plenty in Wales too. So this is really the picture we would imagine, isn't it, in the Garden of Eden? Dinosaurs would would have been there as well. They're playing with uh, Adam and Eve and, and their kids and running around and having a good time and you think, and hold on a minute, what about T-Rex? He must be hungry, chasing Adam around there, trying to have him for lunch. But you look in those last verses of Genesis chapter 1, you see they're all vegetarians. They only ate vegetables. Because this is all prior to this curse, the fall. After the curse of the fall, things were different. It's a changed world and, and things varied quite a bit. We have a number of books, Dinosaurs by Design, that talk about this sort of thing. They're, they're great sort of books because they're the type of kids' books that the parents buy and they won't let the kids have them because they're just so interesting to read. So have a look at those sort of resources as well. And uh, oh, we're not taking um, payments today. You get invoiced instead. So let me leave with this last thought. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared, though, to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but to do it with gentleness and with respect. And that's really what we're about, to answer the sceptics, to answer the truth seekers. And this is what I believe the apostle was admonishing us to do. Thank you very much. And we're, we're going to call for questions, maybe answers, who knows. Yes? I believe you did some research on um, how we could see light. Yes. Could you, could you elaborate on that? Okay. Um, yes, I've been working on uh, a cosmological theory. Um, just a minute, I'll get some slides. So you guys won't have these slides. Maybe you can try and video the screen or something. Um. Okay, so the question is, how do we see light in a very vast universe? Now, I, I, I wouldn't uh, doubt for a minute that the universe is enormously large, billions of light years across, tens of billions in fact. I have no reason to doubt that. Even if it's wrong by a, few, a factor of two or so, it doesn't matter anyway, you still have a problem. And the problem relates to this idea of light travelling through vast distances of space within a time period of only six or so thousand years since the creation at constant speed of light. But let me start back a little bit. Let me start back with relativity, with Einstein's theory of general relativity that says essentially that time is not an absolute. It's not something we are personally that familiar with because we kind of live in time where we conceive of it in a sort of an absolute way. But relativity broke that notion Time depends on circumstances of the, where the clocks are. These are conceptual clocks. Time flows faster on top of a mountain than down in a valley due to the difference in the gravitational field. This, however, is very different to what my wife sort of thought when I was talking about this one time. She said, do you mean the gravitational force bends the arms of the clocks or something like that? No, we're talking about time itself. Clocks are notional clocks that measure time. It is something that we have to um, apply in our everyday life, though. It's real. It's real science, repeatable experimental science. GPS clocks are calibrated to a, to, are corrected 
for this, this problem due to the fact that the atomic clocks in the GPS satellites at um, 20,000 kilometres altitude tick slightly faster than the same type of atomic clock on Earth. In fact, they run slightly faster by 38 millionths of a second per day. I know it's not very much, but it is a real effect nevertheless. And I have worked on this theory, on the standard Big Bang model, friedman lemaitre model, that's, and I've studied this for many years. It's based on Einstein's theory of general relativity. Recent years, some recent years, in about 2004, I stumbled across a new model, a model called, well, we could call it cosmological special relativity or general relativity by an Israeli theoretical physicist, Moshe Carmeli, and he introduced some different notion the notion that we don't just live in a universe of space and time, but of space, time and velocity. This is really talking about the large-scale structure of the universe, the expanding universe. And the idea that the universe was expanding came from Edwin Hubble in 1929. He published his observations of nearby galaxies, and he, from his observations of their redshifts, he interpreted that the universe was expanding. This was a great discovery at that time that we now live in this expanding universe. And he developed this idea, it's called the Hubble Law, that if you measured the redshift of the, in the light from these galaxies, you could measure the distances to the, the very distant ones just from their, from their redshift. So that's the greater the distance to the, the galaxy, the greater the redshift in its light. This was, the idea was then used by Carmeli to formulate a new theory called cosmological general relativity that applies to all of general relativity. So all the successful tests of relativity in our solar system also apply in the new theory. Nothing's changed there. But it, apl it applies also on the large-scale structure in the cosmos. And his theory was quite successful. In 1906, he predicted that the universe was not only expanding, but accelerating as well, which was measured in 1998, two years later. And it was measured, but be very careful here, it's an interpretation of the measurements that these two different teams made. They were looking at exploding stars, like about 300 of them, supernovas at very distant or very high redshifts, and they were able to independently measure redshift and the brightness of these exploding stars. And then they applied their Friedman model, their standard Big Bang model, and they said, hey, these things are too dim. They're not bright enough, therefore the universe must be accelerating. But that's an interpretation, that's why I give that caution. However, Carmeli's model uh, also fit the same data, but he didn't have to include dark energy and dark matter, which I call fudge factors, you know, because no one knows what that stuff is. 96% of the universe is supposed to be made of stuff we know nothing about. This room is supposed to be 85% dark matter. I don't see it. It's dark. It's a problem. And his theory, his model, it, it seems to be very simple. It's spherically symmetric, a universe that is expanding, an isotropic, um, and I could go into this in more detail, but it's, it seems to match what we see in the universe. However, he assumed the Hubble law is true. That means the universe is expanding. He assumed um, very little else that we can measure um, distance and redshifts, distance from the brightness of the sources and redshifts, and then one unknown, the density of matter in the universe. That was unknown. So then that brings us to this question then. If the universe is so large, time is not an absolute, remember, then how does light travel across these vast distances? So let me illustrate it by this. If you can imagine in the nearby Magellanic Cloud in 1987, there was a supernova, exploding star, right? That, that nice little ring there. But the, the large Magellanic Cloud is 170,000 light years away. How does the light travel within the 6,000 years since creation? And we, we saw it in 1987. Other Andromeda, 2.5 million light years away. How does the light get there that we can see supernova and Andromeda? Well, how do we see Andromeda itself? How do we see the other galaxies? You see, this is the problem. How can we fit all this within 6,000 years of the, the time frame of the Bible? Well, very broadly, I can't show you the equations. They're quite complex. But we have general relativity, a theory of space and time, and it works well in our solar system. Carmeli developed a new theory, 
cosmological general relativity, a theory of space and velocity, or redshift. Velocity is the redshift of the galaxies, and that works well. And I've published papers on this, showing the theory works very well, describes the expansion of the cosmos. And then he put them together, and he got a five-dimensional theory of spherically symmetric isostropic expanding universe, and that works too. That describes galaxies and how they operate without dark matter and dark energy, without these fudge factors. Now, I'm telling you all this because I'm saying his theory fits on a lot of scales in the universe. And when we look at the universe, I don't know if you can see this that well, this is a slice, if you like, looking out at about 100,000 galaxies, and we are there at the centre, and, and it's like mapped outwards from us at the centre. This is a survey, robotic surveys that were done in recent times, and they are, they've reconstructed a map using the Hubble law. It's really redshift that they measure, but then they convert that to distance using that Hubble law. Can you see anything unusual about that top part of that? Anyone see something that they're willing to speak up and tell me what they see? It's what? Uh, yeah, it's true. But there is a lot more galaxies in the top one. Every dot is a galaxy. Every tiny, tiny dot is a galaxy. So it's massive in scale. It's billions and billions of light years in scale. What I want you to notice is that there's concentric structure here. Can you see that? These are kind of like very large scale rings, but it's a slice, therefore they're shells. And they're separated by around 250 million light years. Sorry, did I say million? 200 mega, million, yeah, 250 million light year separation. Yeah, that's right. It's massive scale. But what it means is they're like, um, we are like somewhere here near a spherically symmetric universe where, where there's a unique centre. A superstructure of galaxies, of billions of galaxies, and we're somewhere near the centre. The amazing thing about it is I don't believe we're actually at the centre. And it's really exciting stuff because I did a, uh, a mathematical analysis of this and I found the true centre is about 100 million light years off to the side here. Well, that's exciting because it proves that this is not an artefact of the measurement system. It's not, a, it's not a sort of an illusion. It's real. It's a real space structure. And we are somewhere cosmologically near the centre of the physical universe, certainly the visible universe. God placed us in a special place. And this theory actually works within the framework of this type of idea. The Big Bang Theory says the universe must be just homogenous, randomly distributed, no structure. There's no special place. There's no special point in it. There's no edge. There's no centre. This, this theory will fit such a structure. And this theory solves that light travel time problem, this idea, how do we see the light? In fact, I was talking last year to this guy on the right. He's a Nobel laureate, received the Nobel Prize in theoretical physics some years ago, Gerard de Hooft from the uh, University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And I asked him about Carmelli's theory and what he thought of it. And he says it has a problem. It, it has a tachyon field problem. Anyone know what a tachyon is? It's supposed to be a particle that travels faster than light. But the funny part about it, it this problem that he saw is actually the solution to the light travel time problem. That during, and this bit I have, can't take from the theory, but I can only take from the Bible, during God's day four of creation week, God rapidly stretched out the cosmos. And this is part of this expansion process. It was the fabric of space that was not only stretched, but accelerated. And while that happened, clocks on earth ticked, um, clocks in the cosmos, or shade ticked, a trillion times faster than clocks on Earth. So light travels at constant speed of light everywhere in the universe, but time flows faster in the cosmos during this rapid process of expansion. It's not a gravitational effect. It's uh, due to this stretching of the fabric of space, acceleration of it. And the amazing thing about it is 
this works. You can do the calculations. You can, you can um, read my book in the appendix, the last chapter, the last appendix, has all the equations, how it works. And the light must travel from the most distant galaxies to Earth within 24 hours. It's required from the theory. In fact, this effect is required for everything else to be true in the theory. And that comment by the Nobel laureate highlighted what he saw as a problem and why he should reject it is actually the solution to this starlight travel time problem. So it only appears if you measure the speed of light coming from the distant cosmos in terms of Earth's atomic clocks, it would appear it's travelling extremely fast, almost instantaneously faster than the speed of light that we know today. But that's not actually the case because it's time in the cosmos that goes faster on Earth 24 hours, normal Earth time. So only 6,000 years of history and the whole thing happens within 24 hours of day four of creation. Now, if you didn't understand what I said, here's an illustration. This is an animation. (laughs) Earth and cosmic time, the clocks in the cosmos are ticking really fast during day four when God's expanding the cosmos. Our our galaxy is somewhere near the centre of this expansion process where time is moving the same it is today. That green line indicates at some point God stopped the acceleration of the expansion of space and the clocks both in the cosmos and on Earth tick at the same rate today. Problem solved. Did that answer your question? <laughs> and if you... you th- there's actually um, a DVD out there. In fact, there's a couple. There's one that talks about um, us in the middle of the, cre- the cosmos the structure, the supergalactic structures, and another one that supports it, which is the starlight time and the new physics that helps you understand how all this works. They're, they're both only 45-minute DVDs, but they complement each other, and um, they go through all that again. And if you really want to get into this, this is a book I've written, Starlight Time and the New Physics, that first 110 pages written for the layman. There's only three itty-bitty tiny little equations in the first section, really simple ones. Uh, But in the appendix, 120 pages of appendix, there's about 6 million very complex equations. (laughs) So, you know, it's actually only put in there to make it thicker because, you know, you can't charge $10 for a book and it's real thin. It's just not possible. But have a look at that book. And um, any more questions? Any easy ones? (laughs) Yes. Be, but uh, could you address uh, carbon dating? Yep, <clears throat> of course. Can I get another? S- uh. <laughs> okay. Just um, all right. The problem with carbon dating. Let's talk about that. Sometimes people ask me. They say, Do- "Doesn't um, carbon dating prove, say, the dinosaurs uh, are very old? For example, billions of years old." Okay. Now, if anyone asks you that question, let me first give you a a tip. Um, When you go home, just laugh, but don't laugh at them at the time. Because the reason is this. Carbon dating cannot detect anything very old. The radioactive carbon is uh, carbon-14, has a half-life of 5,730 years or something like that. No uh, professional in the field would ever look in a mineral, a carbon-bearing mineral, um, that they, he suspects is, say, older than 250,000 years. And the reason is he would find no carbon-14 in that because it would have all decayed away. So anyone that's sort of talking to you about dinosaurs and carbon dating, you know, you, you, you are now one up on them because I'm telling you they would never look in such evidence, in such fossils. Having said that, though, uh, the, um, the creationist uh, part of the rate work, I don't know if you're familiar with the rate work, uh, from the Institute of Creation Research, they went to a coal bank. You know, in the United States, you have coal banks. Yeah, you have banks with no money, but you have coal banks. <laughs> and they got some samples of coal, eight different samples, and they split them up, you know, multiple co- bits, and they sent them to three different radiocarbon labs and asked them to date the coal. Normally, an evolutionist never date coal because it's at least 40 million years old, according to their evolutionary theory. This was sent back from the three labs and they got dates for the coal of the order of, what, um, 45,000 years or something like that. Now you think, oh, that's older than creation from the Bible. 
But hold on a minute. It's not 40 million years, 45,000 years. It's a drop in the bucket. You know, it's nothing. But they've made assumptions there. There's a bunch of assumptions, and the assumptions include that the carbon-14 in the atmosphere today is the same as it's always been. Well, that's not the, that's not the case. Carbon-12 in the environment, which is the carbon that we're all made of, that most of, you know, there's only one part per trillion of carbon-14, the rest of it's carbon-12, non-radioactive. We don't want to be made of radioactive carbon, trust, you, trust me, you know. Okay, that also changed. When, when do you think something happened, something catastrophic that buried a lot of carbon-12? Anyone guess? Noah's flood, right? Massive change in the past, 4,500 years ago, when most of the carbon-12 was buried in a catastrophic global flood. Also an assumption they haven't allowed for. If you make those creationist assumptions, that 45,000 years drops down to about 5,000 years, consistent with the biblical flood, the date of the flood. It's amazing. Carbon-14 is a creationist's best friend. Well, not quite. I haven't finished. That book he's holding up has the whole discussion about this, what I'm just telling you, and also about diamonds. So diamonds now are a creationist's best friend, not, not, women, not a woman's, right? Sorry, sorry about that. Um, because they, not only, they didn't stop at carbon, they went and got some diamonds and they took, bought them and they crushed them up. What they do, by the way, is they vaporise them, turn them to carbon dioxide to make these measurements. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a non-recoverable process, unfortunately. And diamonds are meant to be a, um, as old as one and a half billion years, say 500 million to one and a half billion. They come from very deep in the earth, up these diamond pikes, like the edges of volcanoes, very deep, 200 kilometres maybe, and so no one would ever look in diamonds for carbon-14 because it just would have been all decayed away a long time ago. Sent them off, got them dated, they came back, same sort of numbers, 50,000 years or something, carbon-14 in diamond. You can't get carbon-14 to get into a diamond. It's the most impenetrable crystal we have on Earth. It's the strongest, hardest known mineral. But it's consistent with the biblical timeline. If you make certain assumptions about the creationist assumptions, the, the, the accumulation in the atmosphere for carbon-14 and so on, then you get a different date, certainly consistent with the original creation. Yep, that's it. And we're finished. Sorry about that. Have a look at the book table, at the resources, and thank you very much. Are oh, we exactly on time? <laughs>